The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And this week, a Bear County judge ruled that Governor Greg Abbott's executive order regarding jail releases is unconstitutional. But there might have been some confusion as to who qualifies for release under this latest ruling. Eric Hernandez further clarifies what it means and how it affects the Bear County jail population. On June 23rd, Janie Vieda's public defender filed a motion to have her released and for Judge Ron Ranhell to rule Executive Order GA-13 unconstitutional. At the time, Judge Ranhell gave Vieda, who was in jail for a misdemeanor assault, a $1 bond so she could be released, but did not rule on the order to give the governor's office 45 days to respond on the issue. 45 days passed. They never responded. Uh, the district attorney's office was on board with the public defender's office on, on the ultimate uh, ruling that I made. But as to who qualifies to be released caused some confusion. This is not a circumstance where folks would get released early on parole. We're not talking about individuals that are currently charged with a violent offense. This ruling only affects those with low level misdemeanor cases who judges give PR bonds to. The release of these individuals will be a big help to decrease the population at Bear County Jail. We're looking at a, a, upwards of 200, almost 300 people that may be affected by this, that may be able to get out of jail on a PR bond or on a reduced bond. It will also cut overtime costs and save taxpayer money. We don't need uh, a governor's order that oversteps, by the way, uh, making the decision to lock people up to the tune of $5 million in taxpayer dollars. Again, this ruling affects only those with misdemeanor charges here in the Bear County Jail. As for what's next with this ruling, well, the governor's office could file an appeal. Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. We've got some late breaking news we're following out of the city's northeast side. San Antonio police responding to a call for a shooting. This is in the 5900 block of Tranquil Dawn. That's east of Loop 410, not far from Eisenhower Road. We're hearing at least two people were injured in this shooting. We don't know how badly they may have been hurt. This all happened just after 530. We have a crew en route. We're going to hope to have an update, gather some more information as to what's playing out here on Tranquil Dawn a little bit later in this newscast. Well, as students head back into the classroom, some parents are battling stress and anxiety. Dr. Barbara Robles Ramamurthy, a child and adult psychiatrist at UT Hill San Antonio, says it's important to recognize that stress and worry are all a normal part of who we are as human beings, and we have the ability to get through difficult situations. She says after recognizing the feelings are there, Parents should look for what are the options for handling the stress that they're feeling. What are our resources that we have available as a family, whether it's other family members, um, leaders in our communities? As parents work through this transition, Dr. Robles Ramamurthy says learning to deal with uncertainty and being flexible can help families as well. It was breaking news at 5 o'clock. Texas, Texas Governor Greg Abbott now in isolation at the governor's mansion after testing positive for COVID. That's coming from a spokesman for the governor. According to a statement, the governor had been getting tests daily. This was his first positive result. Abbott vaccinated, isn't currently showing any symptoms, and is receiving treatment. By the way, these pictures were from the governor's Twitter last night showing him attending an event in North Texas. That event indoors. And as you can see, there are very few masks in sight. If you feel like you are suffering from legal whiplash on top of the stress of this current COVID surge, you are far from alone. There are cities and counties suing the governor and the state, the state fighting back, school districts jumping into the legal fray as well. One judge's ruling after another has followed, some that contradict rulings that came just a day before. All the while, local governments and school districts are taking their own stand, some in spite of those rulings. At the heart of it all is Governor Greg Abbott's emergency order GA38. So let's break down what's actually in that order. Governor Abbott issued the emergency order on July 29th. The order requires all hospitals to submit daily reports to the state on how many hospital beds are available. And every entity doing COVID testing must send in daily results, both positive and negative, to the state. The state must then share that information with the CDC. 
no governmental entity can require someone to get the COVID-19 vaccine approved under the FDA's emergency use authorization. That means cities and counties cannot have vaccine mandates. State agencies cannot require someone to provide proof they have received the vaccine. That goes for any public or private entity as well, so long as that entity receives any form of state funding. However, nursing homes and other long-term care facilities can continue to require residents to be vaccinated. The order goes on to say that businesses or any other establishments cannot limit capacity because of COVID-19. The order encourages people to follow the, quote, safe practices they have already mastered, end quote, in areas where COVID cases are high. But the order does not allow for masks to be required. And that goes for public schools, too. That stipulation now at the root of legal fights across the state. The order also spells out that no city, county, school district, or public health authority can require masks. There are some exceptions that apply to jails, prisons, and hospitals. The order suspends parts of state and local government code and other statutes invoked by local government that would require masks. The order says violations could result in up to a $1,000 fine. And we reached out to the governor's office for clarification on that penalty to find out if that would be a one-time fine, but we haven't received a response yet. Now, on the date that this executive order was issued, July 29th, there were 695 COVID-19 patients in our local hospitals. As of yesterday, that number had more than doubled to 1,413 COVID patients hospitalized. And we expect an update on local cases during the COVID briefing coming up in just a few minutes at around 6:13. New at six, an English teacher at Northside ISD's Rawlinson Middle School knows about the turmoil and war that has besieged his home country of Afghanistan time after time. Jesse DeGoriato says along with the rest of the world, Harun Moniz watched as the Taliban seized control of Afghanistan and the chaotic, chaotic end to America's longest war. The 11 year old on a rooftop in Pakistan on the book cover is the author of a refugee's story, Harun Monis. I'm lucky, I guess. I'm here. My family is lucky that we're here. And I don't really take it for granted. Instead of mobbing cargo planes, the San Antonio Middle School teacher says he and his family were smuggled out of Afghanistan. He was only a boy after the Russians invaded. The U.S. later intervened, only to leave after the Soviet Union collapsed. Then soon after 9-11, when Operation Enduring Freedom began on his birthday, Muniz jokingly told his friends. President Bush gave me my present. Maybe Afghanistan will see peace in my lifetime. But seeing this now, says Muniz, is more like deja vu. It seems like we're turning our back on the country again. Now that the Taliban have seized control, he says it'll take the UN, NATO and others to help stabilize Afghanistan. Without them, I don't even want to think about what might happen to the rest of the world. Or, he says, to the people of Afghanistan. The women and children and those who are being left behind, who are clinging onto the backs of our cargo planes, are the ones who are going to suffer. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. A man is recovering after firefighters say he was dragged 15 miles by a train hanging by his foot. We're told that man was among a group of stowaways who jumped near Quintana Road overnight, but when the victim jumped along with them, he didn't quite make it. Police helped look for that man. They couldn't find him. A short time later, there was a call for a man needing to be rescued from a train across town near Kirby. Turns out it was the same person. Firefighters had to use a special tool to pry open the door and free him from that train. The unidentified man only suffered some minor injuries. Take a look outside at the roads at this hour. This is I-35 at Randolph. You can see things very slow going in the direction the camera's facing here. Don't have any indication as to what might be causing the problems, whether it could be construction uh, or an accident, but definitely Something to keep in mind at I-35 in Randolph. Meanwhile, with the weather situation, I've been playing the prices right. Rain.
come on down. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to come here, but it's got a couple of obstacles in its way. First of all, being the fact that the sun is going to set and the rain off west is going to lose a lot of its oomph. 95 for the high today, so it was hot in San Antonio. Here's a look at that rain right now. We do have some rain moving into Brackettville and Quemado. There is a flash flood warning for Del Rio until 8 because over two inches of rain has fallen in that area. Meanwhile, rain moving into Fredericksburg and northern Kendall County as well. Again, two and a half inches of radar estimated rain in those areas. Also, to the south of San Antonio near Floresville, we've got some pop up showers. So there is a 30% chance for isolated rain tonight, but again, it's got to hold on through that sunset. We'll continue to keep a look at things. By the way, temperatures falling into the 80s by midnight, and we've got another chance for isolated rain tomorrow as well. So hit or miss showers in your forecast. I'll have a look ahead at that. And unfortunately, a heat wave on our way coming up after the break. Coming up tonight at 9, a special collaboration between the KSAT Explains team and the KSAT 12 Defenders. Six months after that catastrophic power grid failure that left millions in the dark and in the cold, we're taking a look at what went wrong and what needs to happen to prevent a repeat event in the future and what's happened so far. That's coming up tonight at 9. You can watch that right here on KSAT 12, on KSAT.com, and on the KSAT TV app. All right, normally on Tuesday and Thursdays, this is the time when we give you the COVID update from City Hall, but they're having some technical difficulties there apparently. So we're going to switch gears and go to weather. Yeah, we'll be ready to, to go to uh, the mayor and the judge if they can resolve those technical issues. But for now, let's talk about the hope for rain tonight. We do have some showers off to our west that have been bringing a lot of rainfall for areas in Valverde County. Uh, and in fact, too much of a good thing out there where there is a flash flood warning. But for now, let's take a look at where that rain is. It's pushing into Kinney County at the moment. So Brackettville, you look to the south and to the West, you are seeing flashes of lightning and hearing thunder. Similar story for Kemado. It's going to be a wait and see thing if uh, these thunderstorms can cross the river there and move into Eagle Pass, but it is a possibility. Now, earlier in Del Rio, more than two inches of rain fell, a record for the day. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, too much of a good thing. There is a flash flood warning in this green polygon here for Del Rio and parts of Eastern Lake Amistad until 8 p.m. tonight. So for the next two hours, flash flooding is going to be a possibility as the rain runs off uh, from earlier showers and storms. Also, we're also seeing some uh, light to moderate rain pushing into Kerrville at the moment. Now keep in mind, that uh, the heaviest of this rain is currently in uh, parts of Gillespie County just to the west of Fredericksburg, but still uh, this is going to be clipping the northern part of Kendall County as well, just to the north of Sisterdale. Now, unfortunately, I can't promise rain in San Antonio tonight because as the showers and storms uh, interact with the sunset, we are going to see them lose a lot of their oomph. So they may hold on, but they also may, may fizzle out as well. We've also got some isolated showers near Floresville, near the Nixon Smiley area uh, this evening, and these are forming some weak outflow boundaries. So the chance for rain in San Antonio is there tonight. It's not a great chance. It's about 30%, but it is there. And of course, I'll be keeping you updated all evening long on air online in our KSAT Weather Authority app. Now, why are we seeing the rain? Well, there is a trough of low pressure up near San Angelo right now. You can see it firing off some showers and storms in West Texas as well this evening. This is going to be pushing off to the north and to the east, so it's going to be moving out of the area, but it is going to provide us with enough energy to allow for isolated showers and storms tonight and tomorrow as well. You can see in the future cast that just in the next couple of hours here, we could still have some lingering showers around San Antonio. Then looking at tomorrow, starting off on the quiet side with temperatures only uh, in the upper 70s and the lack of rainfall for us in the morning hours. But once again in the afternoon, isolated pop up downpours are possible. And as we've seen today, these uh, rain showers are effective rain producers in Del Rio. So wherever the rain pops 
wraps up, it could deliver a quick inch of rainfall. But again, the chance for rain not exceptionally good, only about 30% for tomorrow in the afternoon hours. Uh, 96 for the high temperature tomorrow. We were at 95 today, a degree shy of average. 96 is the average. We'll be close to 90 degrees at noon. Southeast winds at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Tropical Depression Fred is falling apart across Appalachia at the moment, but it is producing a lot of rain. Me meanwhile, Tropical Depression Grace currently moving through Jamaica, where tropical storm warnings are in place. It's got wind sustained at 50, gusting up to 65 miles per hour. Grace is going to strengthen into a into a hurricane and bring a hurricane warning uh, conditions to Cancun and the Yucatan Peninsula Wednesday night into Thursday. Then it's going to emerge into the Gulf of Mexico, restrengthen as a hurricane and impact Tampico by Friday into Saturday before falling apart across the mountains of Mexico. While Grace is spinning to the south of Texas, a ridge of high pressure is going to move into place and this is going to bring a lot of heat for us for the end of the weekend and into the next week. Now we have yet to technically hit 100 degrees at the airport uh, yet and I don't want to jinx us. OK, but it is an entirely a possibility with that ridge of high pressure for us to be close to 100 degrees by the weekend's end and into early next week. So yeah, if somebody who crosses your fingers, cross your fingers <laughs> for no 100 degrees. At least we can hold on to that technicality. <laughs> Stephen right. Myra. Thanks, Sarah. And as for that COVID briefing, we've learned the city has a budget session underway right now. So as we understand it, they'll be posting information on the COVID briefing from the city and the county later on this evening. We will link to that and bring you those updates on KSAT.com as well as the night beat. Yeah, seems to be some confusion mm -hmm. going on. And obviously, if they give that update before this newscast is over, we'll bring it to you. All right, let's switch to sports now. How is Dak? Who better to ask than one of his receivers? Yes, C.D. Lamb. He is very excited to have Dak back on the practice field. Dak practiced with the boys last night up at the Star in Frisco, and the young man is thrilled to have QB1 back. Plus, right here in town, Sam and Houston Hurricanes. They are our BGC preview today. Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott practiced with his team at the Star in Frisco last night. He went through throwing drills with his wideouts and reportedly didn't show any ill effects with his strained right shoulder. Dak was held out of team drills and seven on seven drills because the boys are erring on the side of caution big time with QB1. Still, it was great to have Dak back. It's always a pleasure, you know, having QB1 out there and uh, just him fighting, fighting, battling the things that he has going uh, shows a lot to us, to the team, and uh, he's, he's a great leader. And like I said before, I can't wait to see him out there. Star wide receiver Amari Cooper, who's coming back from ankle surgery, practiced last night for the first time this offseason. And Houston Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson hasn't practiced with the team this week, at least when the media is there. Last week, Watson snapped at the media as he walked to the practice facility outside NRG Stadium, asking why they film him every day. Head coach David Coley says Watson is there at practice and doing what they ask him to do. No, they, he got his work done yesterday. He just didn't get his work done when we were out here. We had a little different schedule yesterday than we had been, but he got his work in, and he's doing fine. Receiver Anthony Miller, who suffered a slightly discolated, dislocated shoulder Saturday at Green Bay, will not require surgery. He just needs rest and rehab and hopes to return early in the season. Led by second-year head coach Quincy Stewart, Sam Houston is going through the grind as they prep for their season opener. Last season, the Hurricanes went 3-2 and two overall, playing just five district games due to COVID-19. That was tough for Coach Stewart and his players because he was new to the area and he was also installing a new system. The pandemic cost them games and time, but the Canes battled through it all. This season, the Hurricanes have nine starters returning, five on offense and four on defense. Plus, they're going through a true offseason, which can only help them when they line up to play football in District 13, 5A, D1. We're going to see if these guys have grown up with a year under a new system. Um, 
we had them in off season this year, so uh, we got a lot stronger, got a lot faster, had a, a full summer strength and conditioning program. So I'm excited about uh, these guys getting an opportunity to play 10 games this year. We had only five games, and that wasn't like, to me, it wasn't enough for like to actually showcase what we can do, you know. It's real important because a lot of these younger guys really look up to me and us as a senior class. So whenever we do good, that inspires them to do the same thing. Sam Houston kicks off the season Thursday, August 26th against Fredericksburg, 7 p.m. at Alamo Stadium. Texas A&M San Antonio women's soccer team is eager to start their first season this weekend. The Jaguars are ready to go last year, but COVID-19 canceled their plans. And some of these ladies haven't played a match in more than a year. We were able to bring in some players last year, but due to COVID and everything, uh, we just trained. So we're ready. We're ready to go. We're very excited. We got a full team here, and uh, we're, we're ready to play. So it's, it's very exciting. With the team, um, with what we've been practicing these last few days, there, there's a lot of potential, and I'm pretty sure we can make it far. Um, it's just being positive and be able to connect as a team, and it's very exciting to do this. The Jags women's and men's soccer teams open up on the road this Saturday at Texas Wesleyan. All right, and we are, what, nine days away from high school football starting? Yeah, next Thursday. <laughs> Woo! Larry's next ready year. to go. All right, thanks, Larry. <laughs> Our KSAT Q&A is up next. It's a time of the show where we like to separate fact from fiction, and we are joined by epidemiologist, a disease detective, Sharice Rora Allegrini with the San Antonio AIDS Foundation and many other things going on. Thank you for joining us, Sharice. And, and, and for, right off the top, I want to talk about where we are right now. And is there a way to predict how long the surge is going to go on? I know there are some people who are saying, well, with at least a, m some number of people vaccinated and people having already got COVID, that hope that this surge will not be as long as surges we've seen in the past. Do you agree with that? Or is there any way to well, know? I'm, I'm hopeful that it won't go on as long because we have fewer people that are susceptible because we've had so many people vaccinated that I'm hoping this surge isn't going to go on for months like we saw before. However, we're seeing more children being infected and children under 12 are not vaccinated. So are we going to see a, a long surge in kids? Possibly. And that's actually what's really scary. Um, I do think that in adults, we're going to see the rate start to drop. I just don't want to see it increase in kids. And I'm a little nervous about that. And, you know, I still continue to hear people making comparisons to the flu, saying that COVID-19 <laughs> is like the flu. People die of the flu every year. Children die of the flu every single year. And so I want to get your take on, on this assessment to see if it is accurate that most of us have spent our entire lives being exposed to the flu. So our immune systems, they have experience with the flu. We also have the ability to vaccinate kids, babies, six months and older from the flu. That's much different than where we are right now in this pandemic. So is the reason we need to get more people vaccinated to give us that baseline protection that would prevent severe illness, prevent death, but also to protect these kids who cannot have that protection that's available to anyone over 12 at this point. Right, you just gave an excellent example of how the flu works. Most people have experienced the flu in some form or another over the course of their lifetime. So most people have some immunity to some strains of the flu and we have a vaccine available starting at six months. That's not the case for COVID. Until a year and a half ago, nobody in the world had seen COVID before, which means there's absolutely no immunity. So we have a lot of catching up to do. And really the only way to do it is to get vaccinated right now. Um, flu mutates differently. It's a very different kind of virus than what, what we have for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so making the comparisons is a little bit difficult other than the illness is a little bit similar. Um, but COVID is much worse. Every year we have about 200 children die of flu. So far we've had over 400 children die of COVID. That's a huge number, especially given that we don't have immunity in kids. Are you concerned that when we talk about mutations and, and the Delta variant and people talking about the Lambda variant and all these other things, that the more that this thing mutates and comes up with different variants, that eventually we're going to get to a place where the vaccine that we have right now isn't going to be effective against one of those variants? Well, 
uh, no, I'm not actually worried about that. Despite all the variants, that's that's a normal process of evolution. Viruses evolve, viruses mutate. Most of those mutations don't really have any effect. Occasionally, a mutation will, will escape and be more significant. Um, but the way we control that is we get vaccinated to most of the population, so the virus can't be spreading. It doesn't have a chance to mutate because it's not replicating so much, because it's not being transmitted from person to person. So while it would not, the vaccine doesn't get rid of the, the virus completely, it can bring it down to low enough levels that we don't see this rapid evolution and we end up with um, escape mutants. I know that earlier in this pandemic, we focused a lot on a two week timeline, seeing what happens two weeks out from a big event, whether it's you know a holiday, for example. Mm -hmm. The big event right now is back to school. So, and that's, you know, a huge concern for a lot of parents with this Delta variant. What are you expecting that we will see as so many kids are back in classrooms in the coming weeks? Well, let me start off by saying, I hope I'm wrong. I will like nothing better than to be wrong, but I, I expect that we're gonna see a surge in cases in children, particularly under 12 and in teenagers that are not vaccinated because we're putting a large number of people together in close quarters without mitigation efforts you know in my kids school they're wearing masks religiously and i'm, I'm hopeful that that's going to make a difference but in many schools they're not in many schools there's no protection so i do see expect to see an increase in the number of cases over the next few weeks incubation period for delta is shorter so we start to see cases sooner i'm hopeful that we'll be able to keep it under control but the way to do that is to try to mitigate the spread in schools What's your advice to parents that are out there? I mean, you're a parent of an 11 year old, I know. Uh, obviously Myra has younger children. I mean, I'm, I'm at a place where my kids have all been vaccinated. So what is your advice to parents out there that are concerned, that are stressed by all this that's going on? Vaccinate everybody who can be vaccinated because you form a sort of safe cocoon around the child who can't be vaccinated. So you're less likely to bring the virus home to the child that can't be vaccinated. Have your child wear a mask, have them wear it properly over their nose um, in school. And most kids are fine with that. Most kids, if their parents tell them to do it and they're used to doing it, they, they have fun with it. Get them cool, funky masks with funny names and funny characters that make them happy. And talk to your schools. Um, insist that there be mask wearing. Talk to the, the teachers and the faculty and everybody that you can, other parents, about vaccinating everybody over 12 because all of those things will help protect those kids under 12, as well as everybody else that's potentially exposed to the virus. Sometimes I have to remind my four-year-old to take it off. He's quite content in the mask. <laughs> exactly. I, I find it interesting that we've got people still refusing the vaccine, but then we also have a, a great number of people who are clamoring for a third dose. They want that booster shot. And it seems that we have to lessen the gap between the two. Is that the only way that this pandemic is going to end? It really is. We have to just get more people vaccinated. I'm excited about the third dose. It clearly seems necessary for people who are immunocompromised. But really what we need to focus on is getting more people protected, which means really addressing the hesitancy that folks have, answering their questions, and making it easier for everybody to get vaccinated by bringing the vaccine to them. You work with the San Antonio AIDS Foundation. I want to put up, uh, uh, I think we have a graphic right now with what's happening on Friday, the chance to be vaccinated. Uh, it's sponsored by SAAF, Pfizer and Johnson Johnson available 9 to 330, 818 East Grayson Street in the cafeteria area. Talk about the LGBTQ plus community. Are you seeing high rates of vaccination? Do you have a sense of the vaccination rate in that particular part of our community? You know, in the LGBTQ plus community, I'm not sure. I know that in general, that population is hesitant to seek med medical care, often because of discrimination. So there's there's a lot of anxiety just seeking medical care. Um, I haven't heard necessarily vaccine hesitancy um, in that population, but like any group, they wanna go where they feel safe, where they feel comfortable. And so we wanna make sure that we're making the vaccine available in all places and in a place like ours is very comfortable to the LGBT community. Um, our event is open to the public. Anybody is welcome to come. And we're really grateful to San Antonio Metro Health. They'll be the ones that are actually giving the vaccine. Where actually is this? Is this a particular building that we're talking about here? 
Yeah, so it's the, the San Antonio AIDS Foundation offices in Government Hill. Um, our offices have a little cafeteria off to the side, but you'll see it when you come up. We're going to have entertainment outside. We have signs outside. We'll be serving lunch. Um, to anybody that comes in, we'll give you a uh, fiesta medal for anyone that comes in. But yeah, it's the San Antonio AIDS Foundation offices on Grayson Street, just up the road from the Pearl, a couple blocks away from the Pearl. Great. Just another way you can go get that vaccination. So easy, so many opportunities within our community. And I want to keep driving people to our website. I know that's where you can find plenty of opportunities in your own parts of town to get the vaccine. Sharice War Allegrini, always a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sharice. We'll be right back. A historic jump in food stamp benefits for millions of Americans who rely on them. The Biden administration has announced an increase of more than 25 percent above pre-pandemic levels. That's the largest jump in the program's history. And as Stacey Cohen reports, the boost comes as a temporary increase of 15 percent was set to expire at the end of next month. A major boost for struggling families. Food stamp benefits are jumping 27% above pre-pandemic levels, the largest increase in the program's history. For food stamp recipients, the program has been a lifeline. It was, you know, life or death. We were either going to starve or we were lucky enough to qualify for SNAP benefits. The Department of Agriculture, which oversees the program, made the announcement Monday. The agency says under the permanent revision, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, the formal name for food stamps, would add an average of $36 per month per person. Beneficiaries received $121 per person before the coronavirus pandemic. The USDA says their priority is making sure their resources are reaching those who need it most making sure that we are meeting the needs of families with very young children. That is just critically important for today and our future. The economic impact of the pandemic sparked a jump in food stamp participation as hunger grew nationwide. The USDA says about 42 million people were enrolled in the program in May, up from nearly 37 million in February 2020. Those who rely on federal assistance say the extra help has gone a long way to helping them put food on the table, especially with inflation and rising cost of groceries. I am a real person who had a real job, and now I need help so that I can provide for my children during this hard time. I'm Stacy Cohan reporting. The increase takes effect in October. The changes stem from an update to the Thrifty Food Plan, which determines benefit amounts. The plan estimates the cost of groceries needed to provide a budget-conscious diet for a family of four. All right, as we take a look outside with live cam, all right, there's some clouds, maybe some gray clouds, but we haven't seen the rain that other parts of our viewing area has seen, Sarah. Yeah, that's right, Steve. In fact, Del Rio currently under a flash flood warning until eight because of over two inches of rain that has fallen in that area. Those showers are falling apart, but they're going to try to make a run for that I-35 corridor. Today was a very normal day in San Antonio. We hit a high of 95 and a low of 77 right there at about average. It got up to 91 in Carrizo Springs and 97 in Del Rio before that rain moved on in. And coming up in the forecast, we'll talk about how we are seeing downpours in spots. I'll have an updated look at the radar. We'll track the tropics and where uh, Tropical Storm Grace is headed. And unfortunately, we do have to talk about a heat wave probably coming soon to San Antonio. Coming up after the break. We've got those numbers in from the city and the county briefing on COVID-19 this evening. Let's start with some progress. The positivity rate down to 16.9% last week. It was more than 20%, around 21.4%. Yeah, that's some good news. The seven-day moving average of positive COVID cases, 1,628. We have 1,383 people who were hospitalized in San Antonio and Barrett County hospitals, 370 people are in intensive care tonight. Let's turn to the weather now, and I'm sure something's sticking with a lot of people. Sarah Spivey said a heat wave. Yeah, yeah. does look like we're going to get pretty toasty in the end of the weekend and into next week. But today, 
as we head into the evening hours, we still have a small chance for rain around San Antonio. Now, most of the heavier rain has been confined to the west, well to the west of San Antonio. You can see that there's still some lingering showers moving into Brackettville and into uh, parts of Uvalde County. But this is a great example of how we're losing the daytime heating. And so these storms, which were fairly strong over near Del Rio, have since fallen apart quite a bit. Now, there's still a lot of runoff to contend with from the storms that fell in Del Rio. So because of that, there is a flash flood warning still in effect for the next hour and 15 minutes for areas in Del Rio points north and just to the east of Lake Amistad. In these areas, more than two and a half inches of rain fell, and that is just too much to, and it created some flash flooding issues there. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and take a look at the radar a little bit closer to the metro area, and you can see that there are still some showers trying to push on uh, to the east. Now, most of that rain is light and it is falling in west eastern Kerr County at the moment, but there is one thunderstorm, one lone thunderstorm just to the north of Floresville here. And it's got quite a few flashes of lightning with it. At last check, there were about four flashes of lightning. Uh, this is a heavier rainstorm. It is pushing just to the north here, and it may cross into Bear County just to the east of uh, Calaveras Lake. But again, the chance for rain tonight, not exceptionally good, just about a 30% chance through about sunset. It does look like that uh, the loss of daytime heating here has really put a pause on a lot of the healthier rainfall out to the west. But the reason for the rain and the reason why we're going to have a chance for isolated showers tomorrow and thunder showers tomorrow is because of a trough of low pressure. It is moving to the north and to the east. You can see just how many areas in Texas received healthy rain from San Angelo to Dallas and down to our KSAT 12 viewing area of Del Rio. That is again going to allow for just a few isolated showers here through the rest of the evening until about midnight when we'll see the tap turn off. The better rain chances up to Austin tonight and then starting off the day tomorrow rain free. So don't worry about rain on your morning commute it should be all right, uh, but we are going to carry a 30% chance again in the afternoon for a couple of pop up downpours and wherever it does rain, the rain will come down hard. But again, the majority of people unfortunately will miss out on the rainfall uh, both tonight and tomorrow 20 to 30% chance tonight. Uh, sunsets at 812 and we'll see clouds develop in late 80 degrees by midnight and we'll be starting off your Wednesday in the upper 70s a lot like we did today with some morning clouds, muggy conditions. It'll already be near 90 degrees at noon tomorrow and 96 for the high. As with the last couple of days, the heat index value is going to be anywhere from 100 to 105. So it's going to be a toasty day. But if you do happen to get one of those downpours tomorrow, consider yourself lucky and you'll be able to cool down from that rain cool there. Southeast winds at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Let's talk about the tropics because they're really starting to heat up. We're starting to see Atlantic hurricane season ramp up as it typically does this time of year. Tropical storm grace is currently bringing tropical storm conditions to both Cuba and to Jamaica. It's got winds at 60 miles per hour. It's strengthening over these warm waters and it's expected to become a hurricane impacting Cancun uh, potentially and uh, parts of the Yucatan Peninsula Wednesday into Thursday, re-entering into the Gulf of Mexico, strengthening again as a hurricane and making landfall near uh, Tampico and Veracruz on Friday and Saturday before falling apart over the mountains of Mexico. While that's spinning to the south, it's actually going to be steered by a heat high, which is going to impact our weather here in San Antonio. That's going to be settling over to Texas. Now, this is a very normal weather pattern for the summer months. We just have not seen seen it yet here and we have yet to hit 100 degrees technically at the airport. But with this heat high settling over, that is going to be in the realm of possibility. We will be near 100 degrees likely for the start of the next work week. I know that's not the best news that everyone wanted to hear, but it was bound to happen at some point during these summer months for us over the weekend, though. At least if your kids are already tired of school, you can get some summertime activities in <laughs> yeah. the pool on Saturday and Sunday, right? You know, I thought, okay, we made it through June. We made it through July. There's no way we're going to make it through August oh. without 100. Mm, I was hopeful. It's yeah. possible. It's not, in the, it's not on the seven day. Technically, yeah. yeah. Technically. Yeah. We'll be right back. <laughs>
We're gathering some more information on that breaking news we've been following throughout this newscast. A shooting reported on the city's northeast side. Yeah, police say it may be a drive by shooting. To give you an idea, we're talking about the 5900 block of Tranquil Dawn. It is east of Loop 410 near Eisenhower Road. Our Jaffney Gray is there now with the very latest. Jaffney, I, I have to imagine that neighborhood shook up today. Yeah, no, definitely. The neighborhood is extremely shocked right now. They said that it's mostly peaceful all the time, and then this happened. So I just want to give you guys an idea of what took place. You see those markers on the ground? We've counted at least 20. So what we know right now is that there was a 16 and a 17-year-old teen boy walking down the street when a silver mid-sized vehicle drove by and just started shooting. Now, police say they do not know exactly what led to that shooting. They don't know if this was some type of dispute that was going on. They're still investigating that right now. But yeah, those that those teenagers in some critical condition right now, they said one of them in, is in triage and another in surgery as we speak. Now, again, we've been out here speaking with neighbors. You notice that this entire block has been blocked off right now. But neighbors say that the, this is just a big shocker to them. They said that they, it sounded like thunder happening. So tonight at 10, we're going to have a wrap up of everything that happened. And we're going to hear from some of those neighbors about this neighborhood. But for right now, live on the northeast side, Jaffe Gray, KSAT 12 News. We'll be back after the break. There's some light rain out west toward Uvalde and Concan this evening, but one thunderstorm just to the uh, east of Elmendorf is going to be moving into uh, Bear County here, impacting potentially Adkins and the extreme southeastern part of Loop, for Loop 1604. Rather, a few flashes of lightning, so a chance for isolated rain this evening, about 30 percent, 30 percent tomorrow during the day, and then a hot weekend. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for watching the news at 6. See you at 10.